Welcome to another Anarchism Research Group video. In this episode, historian Mike Finn talks to us about anarchist influences on education policy and studying history with an anarchist squint. Don't forget to click subscribe and like and share this video. My name is Mike Finn. I'm an historian of post-war Britain, contemporary Britain as well. Um, I've worked on a range of different things, but probably most recently, the stuff that I've been most focused on is looking at the ways in which education policy, the British state, um, and British socialism have all kind of interacted with each other and the ways in which actually increasingly I've been looking at anarchist influences in those intersections and I've got a book coming out in the course of the next year which is called Socialism, Education and Equal Opportunity which focuses on those questions in the context of Anthony Crossland, you know, socialist theorist, labour politician and the ways in which he was influenced by anarchist and libertarian ideas and the ways in which that played into some of the policy decisions that he made in relation to education. We are afraid, we are brave. These hearts, they do beat. We are real. So I think one of the interesting things about when we think about anarchism and education in Britain is the ways in which it's usually a story that's told at the margins. So it's usually a story that's told about small-scale endeavours, often the case with anarchist initiatives, at the margins of society, free schools, anarchist communist Sunday schools before the First World War, kind of drawing on Francisco Ferrer and that sort of thing. What we don't see really in the story of anarchism and education in Britain is an investigation about the ways in which libertarian, socialist, anarchist ideas still played a role in broader educational questions and had more of an impact. So what I've looked at, what I've tried to look into in two different areas of my work is firstly the way in which the state relates to higher education and the ways in which that kind of you know can be looked at through an anarchist lens if you like and then in this more substantive project that's now coming out as a book looking at the ways in which socialist ideas more of a libertarian tinge if you like of an anarchist variety um, made an impact on the ways in which people and particularly politicians thought about how to implement secondary education and where the role of the state should be in that. Should it be directive? Should it be coercive? Should it be organised amongst local authorities as it generally was in England and Wales? And what the character of that education should look like? And I've done that in this particular case through looking at Anthony Crossland, the revisionist theorist and the Labour politician. He was also the education secretary between 65 and 67. So I've looked at Anthony Crossland in the connection with, with these issues because He's somebody we think we know, or he's somebody that we, the left thinks it knows, and um, the different factions on the left think they know well. You know, he's often discussed as a kind of proto-Blairite figure. The left of the Labour movement feel that way about him, but also the right of the Labour movement who want to appropriate him for that cause. And what that's really done is it's really taken away from a real understanding of what his motivations were and what his influences were. And David Goodway, in an essay published a couple of years ago, made a provocative claim that some of GDH Cole, the socialist intellectuals, ideas permeated down to Anthony Crossland, who then took them on in his political career. So I was already working on Crossland at that point, but I was sparked to look at his kind of, if you like, anarchist lineage through that, to try and understand to what extent were his actions and his political thought influenced by, by libertarian socialism, perhaps more explicitly. And I do that in the work that I do through looking at his writing, which was extensive in terms of his book, The Future of Socialism, and his wider literature, but also in terms of looking at why it was that he was so interested in comprehensive education right through his career. What was it about that that had libertarian socialist emphases? And I think a clear answer to that in some ways is this attack on hierarchy, his belief that fundamentally hierarchy was antithetical to, um, to a socialist society. And his egalitarianism was very much one that was focused on um, essentially a critique of the state and that also plays out ironically in comprehensive education in the ways in which he saw education being organized. These arms they do break, these throats they do get parched, these legs they do crumble. We do press on and are born... Well I think when people think about anarchist approaches to education, generally they think about pedagogy, they think about the way in which anarchist schools are organized. Um, it's not the case that Crossland appropriates those. Crossland still in favour of classrooms and hierarchical organisation as far as that goes. He's even in favour of some things that contemporary educationalists of a non-anarchist variety will be against. You know, he's generally quite supportive of streaming, for instance. But what he is interested in is the idea, and this comes through in his wider work, he's interested in workers' control, which he's consistently interested in. So there's some syndicalist overtones there. 
Um, and he extends that to teachers and the teaching profession and the idea that they should teach in a way they see fit and they should be free from state directive in that regard. So he's in some ways inimical to the ideas of centralization that we see later emerge within the state education sector. But his real focus in terms of his libertarian socialist emphases is that he wants to build a community that is able to be free. And in order to be free and egalitarian, he argues that community has to know each other. And the big scar on British education, or certainly English education after the Second World War, is the 11 plus. It's the idea that people are segregated at the age of 11 according to supposed intellectual aptitude. And he is vehemently against this because he sees this as creating hierarchies and naturalising hierarchy. And the two, if you like, the two biggest emphases I would see as a sort of libertarian socialist frame for him are his critique of the state, which means that he wants to ensure that schools have as much local autonomy as they can. And then secondly, he, um, he also has this broader critique of hierarchy, which we see correspond with a lot of anarchist and libertarian socialist thinkers after the war, um, which he sees being most liable to attack through the spaces that you can create within the comprehensive school. So in terms of where it actually plays out, the comprehensive school clearly is a state initiative. In that sense, it's obviously not an anarchist one. But in Crossland's mind, it creates space for libertarianism. It creates space for pupils together to build a new community that's organised on libertarian lines, which is not possible in a space where they are segregated. In terms of how anarchists can relate to the state, I think actually one of the interesting things here is the extent to which what Crossland does and some of the ideas that Crossland has actually correspond with people like Colin Ward. So if you think about Colin Ward, Colin Ward in education is, is thinking more in terms of pedagogy and he's thinking more of radical interventions in that way. But if you look at Colin Ward's career, Colin Ward's career does acknowledge the existence of the state. It does interact with it you know, in, his, in his career as a town planner in terms of the uh, discursive interventions he makes to try and shape the agenda in terms of town planning. You know, the fact that he writes for New Statesman and New Society on self-help socialism and so on. That parallels Crossland quite closely. Recognising the existence of the state and being prepared to try and, if you like, make spaces for anarchy, which is very much the war project. You know, that is something that sometimes has to happen in a context where a state will infringe on them if you don't engage with it in some way, shape or form. So I think it does offer us some insights in terms of the ways in which states can be kind of evaluated on the crude materialist criteria better and worse. You know, the state is the enemy, but at the end of the day, there are better and worse states to live under. And Crossland's vision of a much more decentralised state might be one that an anarchist would be relatively more able to sleep at night under. I think in, in the context of Crossland's relationship with the state and his sense of trying to preserve autonomy, I think there are lessons to be drawn from that, obviously for governments. And interestingly, one of those lessons, you know, which typically has been used by the right as an excuse to not do things in terms of social welfare, but actually can be interpreted very differently, is to be cautious when using the state machine. So Crossland has sometimes been criticised on the left for not being forthright enough in pushing through the comprehensive education programme in 1965 to 1967. But part of the reason he was reticent, if you like, to use the state machine was his view that actually local government was a good thing. The government close to the people was in general a good thing, that he was a municipalist, which he was. And on that basis, he was reluctant to use the kind of office of the minister to just close down um, communities' ability to make their own decisions. That's something we don't see very often now in central government. You know, if we take, for example, if we look at the ways in which central government has operated in relation to fracking, for instance, that it's just pretty much run roughshod over local communities' objections, that there's now, notwithstanding um, recent discussions of a ban, there's now conversations about the idea that it might be worthwhile introducing legislation to override local authorities' ability to prevent fracking. We can see there's a very different ethos operating in government now. So I think that caution about using the state um, and blithely using the state, and also Crossland's fear that in doing so, you irrevocably change the relationships within people. I think that that is an important lesson which has very much been forgotten, both by the left and the right. Thankful for the sun. So I think in terms of an anarchist approach to history, one of the things we have to think about is actually there's very little history that's been written by anarchists um, in terms of academic or professional history at least. And one of the reasons for that is fairly obvious and one of the things an, academic, an anarchist approach can give us, I think, 
is an attention to the way in which history is biased in favour of power. So if you go to James Scott's work, for instance, if you think about reading the past with an anarchist squint, what it does very clearly, I think, is show up the state. It shows the state for what it is in a particular way because history is a state-centric discipline. You know, if you go back to the 19th century, the modern historical discipline very much evolved as a way of legitimising state forms. You know, that's not a controversial assessment. You know, in 1724, the British Crown established professorships of history at Oxford and Cambridge. In the 1880s, the Regis Professor of History at Cambridge, J.R. Seeley, produced a book called The Expansion of England, which was very much about trying to glorify you know, the kind of English state project. So the state and history have always been intertwined with each other at, you know, in terms of an object and also a discipline of study. And I think what anarchist historiography can do or an anarchist approach to history is it can correct for that. Um, now, actually, Marxism has done a great deal in bringing into historiographies, you know, the literature of those who have been driven out of the historical record. You know, we've seen that with the developments in gender history since the 60s, um, the, you know, the, the issues around including um, race and ethnic minority issues within history. Um, you know, we, strong analyses of imperialism as well that have come from Marxism. So we've seen that. But I think what anarchism can also give us, which is slightly different, is when we look at topics that are covered by mainstream history, for example, the education system, we can see ways in which the state operates which otherwise lack explanation or lack plausible explanation. So my first major historical work was, as an historian, was uh, my PhD, which looked at the expansion of higher education in Britain in the post-war period. And I didn't start that as an anarchist. It was part of the reason I ended up one is because of the ways in which the state, on the one hand, tried to legitimise what it was doing in terms of the language of welfare and the benevolence of the state towards the public wider population. But actually what it was doing in the context of what David Edgerton, the historian, talks about, was not an anarchist, is it was expanding the warfare state. And what it was doing was it was remodelling the population for a global economic war. And if you look at that with an anarchist squint, what it also does is it problematises the periods we look at. So when we're activists as well, when we're thinking about trying to resist neoliberalism, what if the problem we're actually trying to resist is more deep-seated than that? So an anarchist reading, for example, of the development of the university since 1945 wouldn't see a golden age between 1945 and 1998. What it'd say is that the state has always been aggrandizing, has always been expanding its power within universities, and that has always had serious consequences for the people within them, even as it has at face value diminished privilege. So I think what anarchism offers us as historians, that's just a case study, what it really does offer us, it offers us a much more nuanced reading of power and state power than either Marxism or liberal historiographies. We can both bring into the records the, rec the histories of the marginalised that have been obscured, but what we can also do is we can take a very critical lens at historiographical topics that have already been well investigated and see the state in a way that we, you know, that hadn't been available to us previously. So I think the consequences for activism of adopting an anarchist approach to historiography are obviously first and foremost that it does bring in more marginalised voices and it provides an ethics of how to relate um, to people's concerns and a way to, to behave in, in radical circles. That's first off. But second off, in terms of the actual things we're trying to solve, the actual problems we're trying to address, it contextualises them more deeply, which I think is helpful, but also it makes us look and think hard about whether we're aiming at the wrong targets. One of the things that the radical left has done consistently forever is make demands on the state. Now, anarchists necessarily are sceptical of that. Now, I know that we have to make demands of the state. The state is real and it exists. But the critical ways in which we do so um, we need to be evaluated and history can help us do that. You know, if the, if for example, you know, we want to take a policy, let's take from the current Labour um, policy suite, if you like, the National Education Service, on face value, many on the left would find nothing to object to about the idea of enshrining a commitment to education philosophically on the same level as a commitment to health. But at the same time, an anarchist would look at that and say the, the, the part of the problems that we have in education today are actually because of the expansion of state power, not its withdrawal. So what happens if you radically increase the influence of the state within education for supposedly benign reasons, but then you end up in a situation where a government which takes a different view then has access to that vehicle? Because it is a natural enough thing, particularly for those who are interested in the parliamentary left, to make demands on the state. But equally, state's expansion generally for an anarchist is never a good thing. So... We need to think carefully about what we do when we're making those sorts of claims. And I think history can help us with that. Ambitions of the rich, those who would rather be assets than members of a people.
We do press on and are born every morning thankful for the sun. We are real. I think the first way in which you can start to do a new kind of anarchist historiography is you can involve different kinds of people in it, for starters. And that's not just in terms of the stories you tell, but also the ways in which you break down your own privileges in a story. So I think as academics, sometimes we're a bit shamefaced about the fact that we're privileged people. We are privileged people. You know, we occupy a particular situation that is socially very privileged. At the same time, to do anarchist history effectively, to be able to offer a squint on a whole series of topics, to bring things to light you haven't seen before, you need to essentially facilitate the ability of groups to make their own history. And so I think one of the things that anarchist historiography can do is in an accessible way, it can write narratives and stories that people can recognize themselves in and can find useful. But equally, it doesn't just do that from a position of privilege. It goes out to the society and it asks you know, people to be involved. So co-creation of history is an obvious one, particularly as anarchist activists and academics. We shouldn't be seeing a division between ourselves and our professional concerns, those of the wider society. You know, ultimately, an anarchist historiography, I think, prefiguratively, should mirror what an anarchist university should look like which means there should be no boundary between it and the wider society you know the, the two should be synonymous with each other the anarchist university should be a living presence amongst the society and ditto the historiography that's a long way from where we are so in terms of initial practical building blocks what does that mean well it means actually checking your privilege getting out into communities and getting involved in groups that are developing histories of communities and of marginalized communities and not being privileged in doing so. Not, not saying that you're going out there to tell people how to write history because you're not. Going out there to learn how to write history um, and also use your privilege to facilitate the entree of that history into the broader academic historiography. That's what you're there for. You're not a gatekeeper, you're there to smash the gate down. Anarchist history is a problem as much for historians as the anarchist present is. You know, if you think about the controversy over Rojava, one of the great challenges for anarchists is seeing anarchism when it's actually happening. I think that's a real issue. Um, if you bear in mind there's no consensus amongst the anarchist community, if you like, on Rojava, then take that back to the past and multiply it because you have anarchists who claim all sorts of non-hierarchical, horizontal organising practice as anarchism in the past, which can be seen as partisan and in a sense can then obscure as much as illuminate the reality of the historical past. So I think that you know, there's not a straightforward division between doing anarchist history and thinking about the anarchist present. I think we have to think about both at the same time because history is a creature of the present, that's what it is. But I think also if we turn that lens on ourselves and we think about the ways, you know, as Matthew Adams has said, the anarchist canon is constructed and we think about the ways in which actually as anarchists we're beholden to a self-mythology. I think being critical about our own histories is really important in terms of any opportunities we might have to not just be wedded to what might be seen as dogmatic positions and being able to adapt to events as anarchists of the past in the 1860s, 1870s and the classic period were able to do in their own time.